In a grand ceremony at the Kremlin today, Russia's President Vladimir Putin signed papers to formally but illegally annex four regions in Ukraine, an area the size of Ohio, after what the West calls sham referendums. The U.S. and allies responded with tougher sanctions and reiterated their support for Ukraine. That all happened at the same time as one of Russia's deadliest strikes on civilians. Nick Schifrin begins our coverage. Today's reality, the body of a Ukrainian civilian killed by a Russian rocket. Today's alternate reality, a Red Square celebration of conquest, a euphoric concert marking Russian annexation. Reality, Ukrainian soldiers re-seizing their own territory from Russian occupiers. Alternate reality, a hand-picked audience cheers Russian President Vladimir Putin's calling today a day of truth and justice. And yet, today's formal annexation signing with the four Russian-appointed leaders of Ukrainian districts is the war's largest escalation since invasion. We will defend our land using all forces and means at our disposal, and we'll do everything we can to protect the security of our people. And to an ecstatic audience of elites, Putin rallied against the West and what he defined as its culture. To maintain its unlimited power is the real reason for the hybrid war that the collective West is waging against Russia. Do we really want in our schools from the elementary grades that children are taught that besides a man and a woman, there are other genders? Such a rejection of faith and traditional values begins to look like a perverted religion, outright Satanism. Putin raised his nuclear rhetoric by recalling U.S. attacks on World War II Japan. The United States is the only country in the world to use nuclear weapons twice, destroying the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Actually, they set a precedent. Putin's actions are a sign he's struggling, the sham referenda he carried out. In response, President Biden vowed never to respect any Russian claim to Ukrainian land. He can't seize his neighbor's territory and get away with it, as simple as that. And the U.S. government sanctioned more than a thousand Russian people and companies, including Elvira Nabiulina, Russia's central bank governor who's helped the Russian economy survive, almost 300 Russian lawmakers, family members of Russia's National Security Council, Russians accused of torturing Ukrainians, and Russian military procurement officials. <laughs> President Volodymyr Zelensky used today to formally apply for an accelerated plan to become a NATO member, and he ruled out negotiations with Putin. It is obvious that this is impossible with this Russian president. He does not know what dignity and honesty are. Therefore, we are ready for a dialogue with Russia, but with a different president of Russia. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Ukraine's NATO membership should be, quote, taken up at a different time. But Putin's nuclear threats top the administration's current concerns. There is a risk, given all of the loose talk and the nuclear saber rattling by Putin, uh, that he would consider this. And we've been equally clear about what the consequences would be. And to examine Putin's nuclear threats and annexation announcement today and where all this leaves the war, I'm joined by Fiona Hill, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Fiona Hill, thank you very much. Welcome back to the News Hour. The Kremlin, of course, has faced battlefield setbacks in the last few days and weeks. Putin recently has been criticized by China and India. What do you think is the context for why Putin is announcing annexation today? Well, it's clear to change the entire nature of the battlefield. Uh, what he's done in annexing this territory is basically transform this into a defensive war rather than an offensive war, at least certainly rhetorically. I mean, of course, you know, this is completely illegitimate, but he's now saying that these territories are, in fact, part of Russia. In fact, he said part of Russia forever. And that, therefore, any kind of attack on the territories of the Kherson and Zaporizhia regions, as well as any of the territories in the Donbass, 
and even further afield to Crimea, will now be seen as an attack on Russia itself. And his hope, then, is that the call-up of Russian troops, the mobilization that we've seen over the last several days, this partial mobilization, will, in fact, encourage now people to the battlefield. We won't be seeing so much of these defections because people will realize that they're in this all-out battle. He's said with the West, not just with Ukraine. And this is a battle for Russia's survival. So he's really taking it up several notches. And he's therefore justifying any kind of action against the West. Of course, you just said any kind of action. Uh, and he brandished what Jake Sullivan today called nu nuclear sable rattling. Uh, Putin said the U.S. had created, quote, the precedent of using nuclear weapons. Sullivan said the U.S. is taking it very seriously. How serious do you think Putin is? I think taking that uh, on the rhetorical level, where he's been very serious about creating this framing there, I think we have to take this to the court of uh, international uh, reaction. In other words, take this to the United Nations and get uh, uh, pushback here as well. But we have to take this threat seriously. Putin is always the kind of person that when he threatens something, he wants to deliver on it. So we should take that seriously. But I think we should also be very seriously engaged in diplomacy now to push back and to point out how outrageous not just his statements are, but some of the claims and the distortions of history. As you just said, the push on diplomacy, of course, would require Ukraine. And Zelensky, as we heard earlier, said he would be happy to negotiate with Russia once Putin was no longer president. There are no negotiations today, uh, and, and there's not much of a chance on either side for negotiations. But does Zelensky's statement and the annexation forestall or further forestall any possibility for diplomacy to end this war? It doesn't forestall diplomacy at all. But I think what it does make very difficult, of course, is some kind of negotiated compromise settlement. Putin's basically saying there is no room for compromise. We've just annexed this territory. It's going to be Russia's uh, in perpetuity. He's also got his eyes on a further extension of the military conflict. I mean, we've seen throughout uh, all of the period since 2014, Russia used to talk about this idea of Nova Russia, New Russia, which also includes Odessa. We've seen attacks on Odessa. We've seen threats against Moldova, uh, the country next to Ukraine, for example. That might also fall under this rubric of New Russia. And he repeated New Russia several times during the speech. So the point here is that he's basically saying, I'm not going to negotiate on the basis of this territory that I've taken. He's basically wanting to have Ukraine negotiate for the terms of its surrender. This is the largest annexation since World War II. It's turned the whole global strategic balance on its head. And there has to be then a commensurate international reaction. So I think that's where the next phase of our diplomacy has to be focused, which is getting other countries worldwide to push back on this act that Vladimir Putin has undertaken today. And finally, the pipelines that take natural gas from Russia into Europe uh, exploded earlier this week. Today, President Biden said the damage was, quote, deliberate act of sabotage. Jake Sullivan said that there were very few countries capable of such an act of sabotage, but that the damage was, quote, not caused by a NATO country. Do you believe Russia would have sabotaged their own pipelines? Actually, I do, especially given one element in the speech today, which I was watching very closely. Putin talks about, he calls the UK and the United States, the Anglo-Saxons together, and suggests that the UK and the United States might have done this as a diversion, blowing up the pipelines, and as he says then, rupturing the whole uh, edifice of European energy security. And then he says, well, people speculate on who does this benefit? And then he smirks. And you can see this because the camera in the Kremlin uh, auditorium base honed in just as he said this and caught the smirk on his face. It's almost like he couldn't stop himself from smirking. And he says, well, of course, the person who benefits is the person who did it. And it made it very clear to me that uh, this was ordered by the Kremlin. But what he doesn't mention is, of course, that he is uh, basically continuing to export oil. So that's the next front to be mindful of. Putin always does something when he, uh, like this, something destructive when he thinks that he can leverage something else. Fiona Hill of the Brookings Institution, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick.